And as we get into chapter 22 and really kind of intermittently for the next few chapters, the Lord heads into some segments that He deals with where it's an, He'll deal with a particular issue through an extended section of Scripture. But He's just as likely in this particular section of Deuteronomy to head into addressing a lot of different issues, a verse or two given to different issues, assorted commands that he has for his people. And some of these things, we can read them, and as we read them and as we look at them, we think, boy, you know, these are really small kind of issues for the Father to be, you know, interested in or concerned about. doesn't seem like any kind of a big deal, but it is a big deal to God. It's a big deal as it relates to our character. The interesting thing about character, true character, we talked a little bit about it this morning, but true character is something that will manifest itself in the big issues of life and also in the small issues of life. It's interwoven into our heart. It makes up who we are and what we are. I think I was reading B.C. today. It's okay to quote a comic, I suppose, in a Bible studies, because he is a Christian, you know. He was talking about, you know, would you lie or would you do something for $100 or for $1,000 or for $10? And the character said, no, he wouldn't do that. You know, and he heads into his cave, and then the guy whispers, well, would you do it for a million dollars? He has second thoughts about that. Well, real character that has been developed in our life, truly by God, will address a hundred dollars ultimately, or ten dollars the same way it will a million dollars. It's a settled issue. Because it's no longer feigning character, it's true character that's there. But character manifests itself not only in the million-dollar issues. Oh, yes, these big things, you know, sometimes they're easier to address properly than the small things, the daily things, the nitty-gritty, everyday, traffic law kind of things. Didn't mean to bring that up, but it hits close to home for all of us. In our lives. And so character... True character will manifest itself the same way in both things large and small. And he begins by, in chapter 22, of addressing the law concerning non-involvement. And he prohibits that. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. Oh no, there goes his ox, there goes his sheep. And man, if I get involved, I don't even want to see that he's lost them. It'll kill me five, you know, five minutes uh, if I if I go to take care of that. So I pretend that I didn't see him, and they and and his and his animals move away from him. Now to have an ox or a sheep in that day was comparable to having uh, something like one of these pieces of farm equipment across across the street over here. Uh, It was a mark of a person who had some wealth. This was a very valuable possession to have an animal like this. And so here is something of value to your brother. And he says, listen, you're not supposed to hide yourself or look the other way. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. He repeats that term, your brother, and he's going to repeat it through these verses. The point that he's making here is something that Jesus brings out as it relates to the second greatest command, and that is that we are to love our brother just the way we already love ourselves. And so the importance of seeing this person as a brother, that's my brother. Jesus gave what ultimately became known as the golden rule, and that is to do unto others as I would have them to do unto me. And I don't want anyone ignoring 
my sheep or my ox going down the street. I'd like someone to stop that, much in the same way that I'd like someone to stop the car thief who is driving away with one of my vehicles. You see, you have to update these illustrations, you know, to match the community that you live in. And so it was a valuable piece of property. And if your brother is not near to you, and these animals have come some distance, and if you do not know him, in other words, the animals come to you, I don't have the slightest idea who owns these animals, but I know that something as valuable as this somebody's going to come searching for, then you shall bring it to your own house, and it shall remain with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with his donkey, and you shall do uh, the same with his garment. And any, not just the big things, anything, small things too, any lost thing of your brother's, which he has lost and you have found, you shall do likewise. You must not hide yourself. and You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along uh, the road and hide yourself from them, and you shall surely help him lift them up again. So the helping out our brother is Christians under this covenant of, of the law, even in the Old Testament, there was to be a concern for one another. Uh, we are to live a life that is higher than the rest of the world, in fact, significantly higher. And that means that we get involved in things that our flesh would normally say out of selfishness, forget it, I'm not interested. It's not me, and it's not my stuff. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. No matter what cities are involved in this, no matter what movies are brought out in an attempt to, or what talk shows there are to try and uh, make this appear as if this is some kind of a normal thing, uh, God says, no, it's an abomination. And it ought to be an abomination in our mind. So, There is to be no confusing uh, among God's people, no blurring of the distinction between the sexes. Uh, There shouldn't be, shouldn't take you a half hour to figure out whether that person is a boy or a girl. and, And some of this is cultural. Now, I really draw a line. I know that men's makeup is out, happening thing. I call me old-fashioned. I think it's great if you're in the theater or whatever, but still yet very much in our culture, makeup is largely associated with women. And uh, so, you know, some of these things get skewed. In India, when we were in India, all of the men wore dhotis, little skirts. They say, we go up there and rebuke them as a Christian. Haven't you read this? You're wearing a skirt. You're skewing the lines between the sexes. You're stumbling, mate. You look around, all the men wore skirts. Little dhotis, these little skirts. It was worse than that. When the men would walk up and down the streets, the beginning of the day, during the course of the day, at the end of the day, and they were good friends, they would hold hands. Walk down the street holding hands. Not just holding hands, but they hold two fingers, just like that. They just hold two fingers. <laughs> In that culture, the little skirt, the little dhoti, we don't need to bring Scotland into this. You understand all this. The Spartans, that's a mini skirts those guys wore. But in that culture, there was no confusion. I mean, everybody understood that. So there's some culture related to that. Now, we live in a nation that's gone mad, basically. I mean, in terms of, I mean, anything and everything goes in, in in a very real way. But there ought to be the ability 
to determine. There shouldn't be this, uh, again, blurring of the distinction of the sexes. The Bible says that male and female, he created them. And there, there ought to be that differentiation within a culture, within God's people. If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. Element of mercy here. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. All of the animal lovers in the crowd, oh boy, oh Oh man, I can't believe it. God lets the people take the little chicks and eat them and eat the little eggs. Little different, you know, culture. You and I, we get hungry, what do we do? I mean, we start to go through our pockets and we go through the ashtrays. And if we can rummage up 39 cents, we can get a burger someplace. I mean, food is available. In, in that culture, when you came across a nest or something like that, that constituted food for you. And, and so it wasn't as accessible as it, as it is to us. But the mother was not to be killed. You don't kill your food supply. You don't kill the source of the food. And so they, they weren't both to be taken. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring blood guiltiness on your house if anyone falls from it. So the roofs in that portion of the world, largely flat-topped, an awful lot goes on on rooftops in that part of the world in terms of of, uh, entertaining, in terms of of, uh, resting, a lot of things. It's It's a section of the house that's heavily used. And, but... They were to put a railing around it. There was to be, in their mind, in in the building of their things, a concern for the safety of others. Uh, No one in your family or you were not going to fall off the edge. You're on the roof all of the time. But you'd have other people over. And so my concerns were to be broader than just myself. I was to have a concern uh, for my brethren, concern for the safety of, of others who would be at my house. Just good common sense. I don't know that there's any common sense anymore. Just good sense. You shall not sow your vineyard with different seed kinds of seeds, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. So, you can't really, if you have a plot of land, just plant a whole bunch of stuff all together. Can't have a vineyard and then go in and plant a little corn, a little barley, a little wheat, and have it all grow up and somehow harvest it. You can't do that. It's not a profitable way to handle the land. These seeds were distinct, and they were to be raised in distinctively within their own plots. Otherwise, it ruined everything. So the necessity of distinction. He said, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. That doesn't go well. One's a clean animal, one's an unclean animal. But they they just don't work well together. They're distinctive, and you either use one or you use the other. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. So they were not to mix cotton and wool and all of that in the fabrics that they were making. Something was to either be wool or it was to be cotton. They were to mix those things together. All of it, in, in my mind, all of it just a reinforcement on the part of God in the minds of his people that there are some things that mix and there are other things that don't mix that ought to remain distinctive and easily identifiable from the other things. And that's what they were to be as a nation. And they were going to go into a land that was going to endeavor to break down the distinctives between God's people and the people of the land. And so God is using very physical things 
to reinforce that concept of distinctiveness, as, as you and I know in this world that we live in. Uh, it works very hard to grind down on our lives to eliminate those things that cause our lives to be distinctive and thus fruitful for God's purposes. And I don't mean that necessarily preeminently as it relates to outward appearance, but just our very hearts, our very motives, the way that we think works very, very hard to make it all blend together so we are um, appear no different from the world. And I think it's a very big problem today, frankly. I really think that Christianity in, in a huge way in this nation is becoming known as this kind of a movement, that kind of a movement, everything but a spiritual movement of God. And, and so these distinctives are, are being worn away and broken down. And the things that make us distinct are the things of the Spirit, Christ's likeness, this work of the Spirit making us like Jesus. Love is a wonderful distinctive. A love for God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and a love for my neighbor as myself. That makes us very different from the world that we ought to. You shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. And we covered that in Numbers. And the four tassels were to remind them of the commandments of God and the importance of obedience to the commandments of God. Every time they look down at their clothes, every time they, for our application, looked in the mirror, there would be a reminder of the importance of obedience as they would see those blue tassels. We know that they're blue from the book of Numbers. If a man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her, then like her afterwards, and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found that she was not a virgin. So, a man has been betrothed to a woman. The woman's father has given her in marriage, and as we're going to see in a moment, virginity was very important in that culture. Uh, pretty heavy to end up married not as a virgin. And so if he went into the uh, wedding chamber with her, went to lie with her and discovered her not to be a virgin, this is what he's talking about. He comes out and he says, I was supposed to, I've been led to believe that I was marrying a virgin, and she is not a virgin. This is a slam against not only the girl, not only the woman, but it's a slam against the entire family. And then the father and mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. In that culture, and it is still heavily practiced in Muslim-dominated countries today, on the wedding night, a white sheet is put down between the husband and the wife, and they engage themselves in sexual activity, and then there would be an associated bleeding associated with that, because she's a virgin, so they think. And then they would take, and this bloodied garment would be then put outside of the tent and taken by the parents as an evidence of her virginity. That's what they're talking about now. The parents have this evidence of her virginity. And the young woman's father shall say to the elders, I give, gave my daughter to this man as wife, and now he detests her. Now he has charged her with shameful conduct, in other words, not being a virgin, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin, and yet these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and then the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him. And this is the punishment. They shall fine him 100 shekels of silver. Again, he has not only brought shame on the woman, but also on the father and the family. So he's to pay 100 shekels for the damage that he's done because he has brought a bad name on a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife, he cannot divorce her all 
his days. In other words, uh, he was required to support her for life. And very serious consequences. It was also a reflection on the remaining daughters within the household and, uh, and the difficulty in that culture then in, uh, in marrying them off. But if the thing is true and evidences of virginity are not found for the young woman, in other words, she is not a virgin, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you shall put away the evil person from among you. All of this is interesting, not that we stone people for these things today. There's no New Testament application here. But it does give us insight into the enormous faith of Mary. When she turned up with child by the Holy Ghost, nobody had probably thought of that yet in that day, to bring the Holy Spirit in as it related to that. And when God comes to Mary and explains that she's going to be with child by the Holy Spirit, a virgin birth as it relates to Messiah, at that moment in time, she speaks to the angel of the Lord and says, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to thy word. And she knew this word. Because if she even ended up appearing not to be a virgin, let alone pregnant, it was at the very risk of her life. And yet her faith was, God, if you're doing this, nothing is impossible with you. And I trust you to take care of the details. I'm going to trust you to take care of all of the surrounding issues, including the reinforcement of the law of Moses as it relates to somebody being found in my condition as a betrothed woman. And she found that the Lord was worthy of her trust. But a pretty heavy thing for her to, uh, to stand in the face of. If a man, in verse 22 is found lying with a woman married to a husband. This is adultery. Then both, it's an important word, of them shall die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away the evil. Person is, is an interpretation. It's, a, it's not there. It's added for clarity. Sometimes it adds clarity. Sometimes it doesn't. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. Adultery is evil to God. Now this is interesting because it gives us some insight into John chapter 8 where the woman who is brought to Jesus caught in the very act of adultery. And the law of Moses teaches that she is to die. She's to be stoned. But so is the man to be stoned. And these religious leaders did not bring the man, though they were caught in the very act. Surely they knew who the man was. It is because of this verse that there are some people who believe that when Jesus said to those religious leaders, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, that he was really saying, let him who is without this sin, cast the first stone. Jesus wasn't saying, listen, the law of Moses is no good. Let's go ahead and do it. But whoever is without sin, go ahead and throw that first stone. And then he begins to write in the dirt. And these leaders begin from the, to leave from the oldest to the youngest. And there are many who believe that he began to write down their names and then the dates of when they had committed adultery with this woman. 
And so they were in no position to stone her. They were guilty of the very same thing. If a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed, engaged in a sense, to a husband, and a man finds her in the city, and that is a key to understanding this, the city, and he lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out again in the city, And the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. And notice, God equates this being betrothed with being a wife in his eyes. Remember that covenant. And so you shall put away the evil from among you. Now, you can look at this and you say, hold on, wait a second. This looks like we've got a woman who a man has forced himself on her, literally raped her in this situation, And she's going to be stoned for that. But that's not what's happening here. Because what's happening has happened in the city. And all of the women of Israel would be aware of this particular law. The cities were different from our cities. We have enormous spaces sometimes between our houses or whatever it might be. And even our apartment complexes are sometimes more private than the way that those cities were. There were no windows. There weren't these things to block sound. And if somebody came upon a woman and began to attempt to rape her, she wouldn't need to make very much noise in order to bring help. And then the man would be stoned to death. And so in light of the fact that the woman didn't cry out in this kind of a situation would indicate consent. That's why they would be both be stoned. But... If a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside and the man forces her and lies with her, rapes her literally, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is in the young woman no sin worthy of death, for just as when a man rises against his neighbor, and kills him. In other words, this is an act of violence, just like assault or murder. Even so is this matter. For he found her in the countryside, and the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her. So out in the field, if she was attacked, she could cry out, and nobody within the distance of hearing her The man's guilty. And it's interesting that she was to be given the benefit of the doubt. The only protection that a man had against false accusation was don't lie with a woman until you've married her. The very simple protection. And if he went out into a field and he lay with a woman or he lay with a betrothed woman, and there was mutual consent there, hey, he's hung himself if she says, I cried out and nobody could hear me. So just sexual morality would protect the man. It's also interesting that under the old covenant, rape was a capital crime. I think I vaguely remember that in my childhood, in my lifetime, I could be mistaken, but I think I remember that it used to be a capital crime in this country. That when you raped a woman, you're a dead man. It was a capital crime. Recent rapes in our community. Woman sitting at a bus stop just over a week ago. Guy pulls up in a pickup truck, pulls out a gun forces her into the truck, takes her out to an orchard and proceeds to punch her face so much that she loses several teeth and then proceeds to rape her. They have arrested a suspect. But the frustrating thing is, if you, for instance, read Parade Magazine in the Modesto Bee today, how quickly these people get out. Sentenced for seven years, out in four. 
while this woman's teeth and jaw and face have the potential of creating pain for her solely on the physical level for the rest of her life, to say nothing of what it's done to her mentally or emotionally or physically elsewhere. The Old Covenant is a capital crime. Hear, hear. If a man finds a young woman who is a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, and they are find, found out, and notice please that word they, this is not a rape, this is mutual consent, they are found out. Then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver. He still has to pay the father the, the dowry. And she shall be his wife because he has humbled her. You lay with her, you took her virginity, now you are to marry her. And he is not to be permitted to divorce her all his days. He was to su support her the rest of his life. Very, very interesting, isn't it? For God's people in the Old Testament, if a man was to lay with a woman and to take that virginity, he had to take responsibility for it. Just for laying with her, to say nothing of a child produced as a result of the union. Very, very interesting how God repeatedly in His Word brings responsibility for individual actions back on those individuals. Here we live in a world and a nation, surely. Fatherless children everywhere, all over the place, failure to take responsibility for their sexual immorality, for their responsibility. But under this covenant, he was not allowed to escape. There was no system to come in and bail him out from his responsibility. He had to do it. And there was the pressure of the culture for him to do it. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor uncover his father's bed. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation, that is, eunuchs, shall not enter the congregation 